Now, I go way back with computers. I have a really unhealthy relationship with them. It's the only <laughs> drug I take anymore is computers. Uh, in, in 1979, my dad brought an Apple II Plus home. It had a modem. And all of a sudden, I had access to communities and tools and ideas that even the most powerful, rich, and, and sophisticated grown-ups of a decade before could have dreamt of having. And every year, computers gave me more power, gave me more access to more tools, more communities, more ideas. I see a lot of people in the audience tonight that I know through computers. I see people in the audience tonight whose lives have been changed by computers. I know that this is your story, too. And every year, I felt like computers were bringing us closer to a kind of utopia where we would all have more agency than we dreamt of before. And then I started thinking about what computers were doing to kids today. And I realized that if you're a kid today, you have a lot more in common with the kids of my dad's generation who wore little buttons that said, I am a student, do not bend, spindle, fold, or mutilate me, and took the punch cards that represented their identities at the universities and burned them, and smashed computers because they saw them as tools for regimentation and control. People who predated the personal computer revolution and people who post-date the personal computer revolution were both justifiably suspicious of computers because today, computers are being used to snitch on us, to spy on us, to control us, to, um, to do things particularly to young people that are a kind of beta test for what's going to be done to the rest of us. So, you know, universal wiretapping is now a fact of life thanks to the FISA bill and thanks to the senators on both sides who voted for it. Right? The Fourth Amendment has been suspended, but the Fourth Amendment has been suspended for young people for as, uh, for as long as there's been internet access in schools. Right? Schools have, for a decade now, paid scumbag companies like Smart Filter, uh, which um, uh, basically they hire boiler rooms full of uh, blue noses to look at every page on the internet and say this one's good and this one's bad and kids can look at this one and kids can't look at this one. And you know they make tons of mistakes. They're just, it's just completely ridiculous that, that this, this endeavor, it's, it's, it's broken and will never succeed. They hire these companies that also provide the network filters for Siri and the United Emirates to filter our classrooms. Right, so kids know what it's like to live without the Fourth Amendment because they've been subject to bulk surveillance long before the NSA got it into their head to surveil the entire internet. Kids know what it's like to have their devices designed to track them because we're taking the bracelets that were designed to track felons and we're putting them on kids who are accused of truancy. Kids know what it's like to have their devices disobey them because their primary access to devices is through mobile phones and game consoles, which are designed to allow remote parties to delete software from them, set policy, and spy on their users without their users' knowledge or consent. So if I were a kid today, I'd be dead scared of computers. And I think that kids today are rightfully dead scared of computers. They know that they're being followed around the internet by marketing creeps. They know that they're being spied on by uh, uh, creeps who scare their parents with boogeyman stories about pedophiles and tell them that they need to let them spy on everything they do, who try to keep them from, you know, we not only have chased children out of the public sphere, they're not allowed to gather on the street or in the parks because of uh, the fear of the other. Now we tell them they also can't get on MySpace because of the fear of the other. We tell them they can't gather online because of the fear of the other. They're basically meant to sit quietly and make as little noise as possible until they're 18. And then we, then we draft them, basically. Um, so I wrote this book called Little Brother that was trying to convince kids that it didn't have to be this way, that they could take back control of their computers, that if they didn't own it, if they couldn't open it, they didn't own it. And once they could open it, they really did own it. That the difference between a utopia and a dystopia is about whether or not the computers control you or you control the computers. And it's been moderately successful and really happy with how it's turned out. And I, and I hope that we are on the verge of a new computer revolution, a computer revolution that convinces a new generation that computers aren't there to spy on them, that computers aren't there to control them, that computers can give them more freedom than they ever had before, and that we can use that freedom to continue to organize different kinds of communities, to organize around our interests, to woo the muse of the odd, to be as weird as we want to be, to be as interesting and experimental as we want to be, to pursue interesting kinds of art and interesting kinds of culture and interesting kinds of politics again. And thank you very much. I just want to say a couple quick thank yous that I got to say before. I want to thank uh, Charles Brownstein, Executive Director of the Common Legal Defense Fund. I want to thank Mr. Dave Francais and the, the hat we got there made the uh, fun, gorgeous little flyer that uh, motivated everyone to come to this event. And um, we're slightly ahead of schedule, which is good. So I'm actually, um, Paul was really nice and, uh, and was really speedy before we could give him back a couple minutes to do a little more show and tell, and he might have a surprise for you as well. Actually, yeah, let's, um, well. 
the thing I have in mind, and I, you know, I actually didn't know he was going to do such a great riff on that. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, when when you when Jeff got, yeah, let's shift over. This corner is a drag. All right. We're both our own riffs. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, okay, so what I want to do is first and foremost evoke what I like to call the gift economy, which is, again, what he was talking about and what's a common denominator between our two books is this idea of social process. So I wanted to give away uh, a group of these CDs, and Jeff, if we could do that really quick. Um, the idea is I, I spent about six weeks in Angola earlier uh, this year them. and last year. Yeah, just passing them down the road. Um, and it's a still a kind of a physical object, but it's a, it's a pun about obsolescence. Uh, I really think vinyl is going to outlast the CD. It's a, it's one of those collector's items things. But um, take one. <laughs> how much uh, information can be encoded on the surface of a plastic file? Depends on how small you write. This is true. <laughs> but um, so Angola was Soviet Africa, and I spent about six weeks there looking at uh, a lot of the contemporary art and digital media scene going on, mainly from the viewpoint of uh, how an African culture could respond after a devastating resource. A nationalist war. Uh, so there's music from all over Africa, stuff from Angola, uh, Tunisia, Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa. And the idea is electric Africa. Um, and I really want, uh, whenever, I was just at Google the other day, and uh, one of the few places on the planet that has almost no Google nodes is Africa. So it's actually the dark continent again on some levels. Uh, but I also wanted to figure out some ideas around mashups. So that's the other CD. So the pun here is we're looking at a social process, a network of exchange. And um, you know, it's if you, if there should be enough CDs for everybody. And if you didn't get one, there's the li the link is online anyway. Uh, so it's about you know, kind of a pun of physical versus dematerialized, uh, and we all trade. You know, so uh, with that said and done, what I want to do is jump into the books. Um, so, in the audience, uh, do you do you think right now? Obviously, uh, you've been in the middle of finishing up several really important and really interesting books. And I've always wondered, how do you uh, process your time? Because you, you, you're traveling a lot, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm traveling as well, but I just can't figure the way that you're able to continue writing and also like, doing all these lectures and over, you know, it's... it's well, I, I, I try to slice my tasks into things that I can do in kind of two or three minutes, and then I never let two or three minute gaps go by. I, I just I basically just, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. I, I, it's basically, you know, if you start collecting, uh, it's it's the it's like that scene with Richard Pryor at the beginning of the toy where where he talks about how if you shave if you shave it, you, it may just be a billionth of a penny, but if you shave enough of them and stick them together, you end up with a lot of money. So if you shave those three minute segments, those two three minute segments, it turns into a lot of uh, time. So that's a, a tremendous amount of focus, and DJ culture is almost the opposite. It's too many people, too much time, everybody's just hanging out. But it's a good, it's, um, it's a nice paradox to balance the two. Um, I and think that's Superman 3, actually. Superman 3, oh, thank you, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. 